<laughs> okay. All right. So here we are in Charlottesville, a chance to have a conversation. And maybe we could just start by introducing ourselves. Uh, some of us are familiar uh, uh, returnees and others are new. And then I just thought we could talk a little bit about kind of your experiences using it. I know we started to talk a little bit about yours, Chad, which was really interesting. Uh, and then just see where we go from there. We have a couple of questions folks have, have sent in to us that we can deal with then and get started. So, so Frankie, you're, you're, a, you're an old pro at this. You want to get us started? <laughs> uh, well, my name is Frankie, and I am from Washington, D.C. I have an undergrad degree in design and uh, just got my MBA from University of Maryland at Smith School of Business a year ago. Now I'm starting a design thinking consulting firm, so helping people with business strategy and product development, helping understand their mission so that they can grow more using the tools of design thinking. Alan, you want to introduce yourself? Okay. My name's Alan. I'm from Charlottesville. Went to school here. And I have a small transportation, logistics, warehousing business in Washington, D.C. Thanks for coming. Hi, um, I'm Jan, and I'm visiting from Milwaukee on vacation. I'm here for the holiday to see my family. Um, I work in the human resources field for a large multinational. And I'm, speakers, I'm very intrigued about the applications of all the design tools in organization development and talent development and building fantastic be great uh, well we are just introducing ourselves uh and saying hello 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 because we need to use the oh you want him to use that yeah gotcha so you want me over here uh, yeah oh. Yeah, oh, actually, you know, that, that, that tricky camera is going to find us whenever we speak, so you can't hide from it. You can't hide from it. That's what I was trying to do. Yeah, exactly. Good try. So how about introdu introducing yourself and just telling us a little about yourself, maybe? I'm Paula Pagonakis. I'm a community resident, and I've been helping small businesses start and keep going for I don't know how many years here um, as an individual and recently started um, within a year an organization to continue doing that, only bringing in other people who are consultants um, on big projects all over the place but are willing to um, do consultation work for our local businesses of extremely affordable rate because they want to give back and they want to give a hand up to help others. Thank you for coming. Greg Baganakis and uh, I work for Clockner Penoplast up in Gordonsville. So we're a plastics company and I'm on the uh, business management side of the business uh, market responsibility. You guys want to introduce yourselves? The rest of the hometown crew? <laughs> I'm Joyce Smaragdis and I'm at the Baden Institute. And um, I also have a passion and I'm trying to start a, a business and I'm trying to learn um, about the principles of design thinking and how I can apply them to grow my business. And I'm MJ Toms. I work at the Batman Institute with uh, Jean and Joyce. And I'm just interested in, in getting a little deeper in the design thinking. Um, I hear a lot about it. Um, but I want to know more. Well, at least you might as well introduce yourself. There might be someone left out there in Coursera land who hasn't yet met you. Um, well, yeah, nice to meet you guys. I'm Luis. I'm helping out with Coursera course with Gene. I'm working here at VA. I just graduated my MBA in, here at Darden, and I'm very interested and involved in all the design thinking initiatives we have here at Darden at UVA, mostly with uh, Gene. So any other ideas, anything you want us to talk or to do about design thinking? I'm here to that. Thank you. Hashtag Great. design biz. Yeah. yeah. Hashtag, hashtag design, design biz. Go for it. Great. Okay. Well, what would people like to talk about? What would be useful uh, for you in this hour or so that we have together? Um, there are also crackers and cheese and cokes and things like that over there if anyone would like one as well. So, Jen, I know you and I were chatting a little bit before everybody else came in. Yeah. Um, the... Um, 
initial learnings for me in this have been how can I take this and translate it into the work I do every day, which is in human resources. And I was telling Jeannie, you know, we were in a team meeting last week and we were looking at the performance management system because we want to do something to contemporize it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our normal problem solving process say, let's brainstorm and just see what sticks. Um, and so I was describing some of the things in the process. Well, you know, we could, we could journey map this and look at it from a couple of different experiences. And that's, that's as far as we've gotten so far. But um, I've been pleasantly surprised at how translatable the tools are. Okay. So these are people who, who that you were in the meeting with who haven't, necess does, haven't necessarily... I haven't seen any of this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I found I had to translate it into company terms that we use, but that the, the concepts were, were very user-friendly. You know, at some, at some level, it is common sense, isn't it? I mean, we are all human beings, and before we forgot about that, <laughs> um, things like people have emotions and emotional highs and emotional lows and all those kind of things. I often find, especially if you talk to people who haven't spent a lot of time in a big organization, when we talk about these kinds of things, they, they look at me like, wow, people like pay you to come up with those ideas. You know, I mean, isn't that kind of just obvious, but especially in bureaucracies and big organizations and, you know, all those, it's amazing how we've lost sight of some of the most basic things about human beings and how to create value for them. Mm. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's always an amazing thing. But I think journey mapping in particular, I think of all the tools, is the one that we've tended to start with. Because this whole idea of tracing the flow of something is something managers are comfortable with, right? I mean, we're used to Gantt charts and flow charts and all kinds of things like that. All we're really doing with journey mapping is, you know, taking one of those flow charts we're comfortable with and putting the real emotions of real human beings in there and then focusing in on what's the job they're really trying to accomplish. So in some ways, I think that's a nice entry point. In my experience, it was yeah. our, our first trial. Mm -hmm. That's great. How about other folks? Are we having some success with experiments? Ellen, you, you, you're like an old pro now. <laughs> Third visit here. What are, are you doing? Well, you and Frankie are the are the Frankie, are the returning alums. Frankie's actually helping me. Is he with the project? And hopefully he'll be helping me with a, another project we're going to discuss after class today. Fantastic. So maybe it'd be better to start. Start with, with him. <laughs> well, uh, I can talk a little bit about the sure. project that Alan and I are working on. So. Alan's company does logistics and warehousing, and one part of the business is hauling equipment for football teams. And so we're looking at ways to partly to grow that business and partly just to maintain excellence in that field because all kinds of businesses are being disrupted now by new technology. The, the companies that are complacent, the companies that are sort of trucking along, trucking along the way they always have been, are the sitting ducks for young disruptors to come in and grab market share. And so one thing we want to make sure to do is to figure out, in the language of our class, mm -hmm. what are Alan's customers trying to accomplish and looking at the solutions that they currently have seem good enough, but sometimes they seem good enough because the customer who is somewhat dissatisfied creates a workaround, mm -hmm. and then it, then it meets their needs. And so that's one thing that we can look yeah. at is where what are the customers trying to accomplish, and what are our solution? What is what are Alan's solutions? And we're starting that process of looking at it through creating a hypothetical journey map mm -hmm. and then presenting that to some of the stakeholders and seeing if it matches with their real experience we're finding that and we're going to look into doing some ethnographies and creating personas to see how alan's company 
meets their needs and what are the unarticulated needs. It's sort of spending a lot of time with customers to find out how to make the company stronger. Seems like cover the basis. And one of the things we're finding that works <coughs> with the journey mapping too that we didn't really talk much about in class was to begin to think about metrics really and how does someone measure success and what are the different measurements of success. So you, you think about in your world of HR as you look at something like performance management, you know, what's the what's the success measure that your clients use? Uh, and and can you kind of work with that as you begin the process? Well, it's interesting because different constituencies have different metrics yeah. on what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you understand those different metrics, it, at least it's the first path yeah. to figuring out how you maximize across different stakeholders, right? And I'm similarly, I'm sure, with the sports story, you've got different people involved, and they all have different measures of success. And, you know, we, we tend to talk about the customer as though there's one single customer, when, in fact, there's usually multiple levels of customers. You know, there's users, there's decision makers, um, there's all kinds of different customers. And journey mapping can begin to let us look at where's the leverage point for innovation that will really be a win-win for multiple different customers. Interesting. So I have a question on sort of thinking about e either of these cases, the football or the human resources, when you're thinking about your ethnographies and these different stakeholders, um, <clears throat> is there any guideline for, um, you know, say they, they're, the customers in the football case are the players, I don't know, the coaches, the equipment manager, all these people that might be touched by the experience, maybe the person who uh, is in charge of the location they're going to. Should the ethnographies be sort of like one for each of those people, or should there be maybe multiple player experiences or multiple different people in the coach area? And similarly for, you know, there's a bunch of different stakeholders in the in the performance review, but within one sort of stakeholder, they could have different types of people. Is there any, like, it almost seems like you could just do it forever. Yeah. I have that question also, because it seems like you could create six or seven personas yeah. in each of seven categories. Yes, exactly. And I mean, the number of personas you, you create, I mean, we, we tend to talk about four, but we just made up four. I, I mean, you could create kind of as many personas as you wanted to create. Um, we know that we have a tendency to treat all the customers as though they were a single entity. So as soon as you create your second persona, you're generally improving your ability to create value for someone, right? Because you're recognizing that all customers aren't a monolith and that there are varieties of customers. And so even two varieties often gives us a deeper insight than we had to start with. I think the problem is, at some level, there are as many different customers as there are different human beings involved. I mean, when we did the persona map, when we did the journey mapping for our MBA students, right, we knew that in many ways we had pretended that there was one typical MBA experience, right? When we looked into it, we realized, well, there are really 300 kind of unique MBA experiences. And there's a number somewhere in between one and 300 that is a good place to start trying to understand where the difference, where the experiences are similar and where they're different. And I think the, the advantage of the two by two is it allow, it forces us really to think about what are the dimensions along which I am hearing difference, right? And so as I design for people at different ends of those dimensions, I really start to pull apart what looks like a monolith into people with different different needs. Right? Now, having done that, I may not try and solve for all of them. I mean, there may be some personas that are just more important to me than others, some that, that I don't necessarily think need to be in my target market or whatever. So design thinking doesn't tell us we have to deal with all those personas once we've created them, but it does give us better information to deal with. At least that's what I, that's how I tend to think of it.
but the challenge is how many, right? In some ways, we certainly don't want to create persona. You don't want to create a persona with four interviews where you've got one person in each box, right? Even though we're not trying to generalize across populations, we do want to be sure that the dimensions of difference aren't just idiosyncratic, right? So I, I think we want multiple people potentially in each cell as we do the interviews. So when you have a lot of different types of buyers, that could add up to a lot of different people, to you know, pretty quickly. And it's interesting because because Sarah uh, had uh, tweeted in to ask a question: How can interviewing be scaled? And I think that's one of the challenges in this in this world, right? It's time consuming. You get a lot of data out of these one on one personal interviews. There's only one of you as interviewer. I think it's maybe possible to scale yourself more easily than it is to scale the people you're interviewing. I mean, in some ways, design thinking always starts with the human being, right? Um, and so going to a methodology like surveys that allow you to get to a lot of human beings at the same time kind of by definition loses the depth and the richness that we want from those human beings. But there are ethnographic tools. I mean, some of the ones that we looked at, for instance, in MiU Health, where the idea of people keeping their own journals, I think, that scales you as an interviewer because I don't have to ask someone to walk through their day step by step talking to one person individually at a time. I can ask a whole group of people to keep a journal and to turn those journals into me. Right? So I can kind of scale myself and get a lot more data, but at the same time, I'm preserving the detail and the richness of each one of those individuals in the process. So I think some of those tools can be a way at least to kind of invite people to almost be their own interviewer, right? And kind of interview themselves and keep some notes that they can later share with me. Does that make sense? I think so. You know, a lot of times we're seeing these days people are setting up online groups. Right? And then these online groups of customers are there already ready for me to ask them whatever questions come up or co-create with them with me around any opportunity. Right? But I've, I've created them once. They're a group of customers or clients um, or possibly hiring managers or things like that. In your case, Jan, people who are interested in being part of the creation process and willing to kind of pitch in and give their time to do things like fill out journals and share their impressions with me and things like that. But there's kind of an economy of scale in identifying that group of, of people once, getting them set up and then going back to them to give you reactions as you as you progress. And maybe it would be a community that is doing something in the downtime that is valuable to them. So sort of a discussion forum about technology. Maybe it's Volkswagen users and they're sharing their experience with upgrading sound systems or something. It is easy these days to eavesdrop in on a lot of people's conversations, right? Even when you're not the NSA. Um, uh, I often find, you know, we think, well, we have to go, over, go out and identify this group of people and ask them these things. But oftentimes, there's already a conversation going on somewhere in the virtual space of a group, you know, between a group of people that are very interested in what you're trying to understand more. And so just tying into them can be really efficient as well. Anything else? What else would people like to talk about? I have an organization that has a unique challenge that I'm working with. It's the local um, technical school, uh, Charlottesville Albemarle Technical School. And we're looking at doing a major strategic um, planning process to bring the school uh, where it should be. Um, we've done a lot of traditional style instruction, and that no longer is valid. So we're working with the instructors and using the design thinking process to try and change the culture. They're so used to teaching in the traditional format and we're trying to move them more towards experiential learning. So we've been using some of the processes to make a shift in the culture of the staff. And um, it's been successful to a point. And to your point, some of the side comments and the side conversations I think are really important and, and they just happened we didn't design it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well when you think about it 
uh, we've talked before, a lot of this is change, how to help people change, how to give them an incentive to change. And oftentimes, as leaders, our idea is we see a change, we know it's important, so we just kind of pronounce it to everybody else. This is important. Please go do this. But most people don't change their behavior because someone tells them to, right? Especially faculty, you can say firsthand, right? They need a reason to behave differently, to go to the inconvenience of changing your teaching, a teaching style that's worked for you for a long period of time. And oftentimes we find that's where bringing the voice of, of, of the person they're trying to serve in, bringing the voice of our students into our faculty conversation so that faculty could hear where we're failing students, where we're not doing for them, creating the rich learning experience we'd like to. I think that softens people up for change. Right. Because instead of you telling me I need to change now, it's like, well, you know, I think of myself as a good teacher and I'm hearing my students talk about the ways in which I'm not fully meeting their needs. That's a much more, I think, powerful, powerful, compelling reason to consider changing than it is because, you know, someone's done a, done a study of educational trends and decided that the way we're doing it isn't the way it should be done. Right. We did do some experimentation in, in a couple classes with the students and uh, gave th them some instruction that we wanted more leadership out of them. We wanted them to be more involved in designing their learning experiences. And it was interesting. At first, the faculty sort of sat back and wasn't sure what they were supposed to be doing. And they were startled that they had so much what they called idle time, which then they realized they could redirect that towards more research for themselves or planning um, different types of activities. Because when do instructors have any extra time. They found themselves with a little bit, but uh, you're right, the, the student led, gave the instructors more of a direction because the students picked it up and just started running with it. Well, I mean, our theme this week was experimentation, and oftentimes in the design thinking process, we have a tendency to focus in on the front end, on the ethnography, and on the generation of these deep insights, because it is so kind of compelling to listen to people tell their stories and, and to have new insights into the people you're trying to serve. But the back end of design thinking, the whole experimentation process, I think is so powerful. Really, um, because no matter how how diligent we are in our ethnography, we're still guessing, right, about how to serve people better. No matter how how much we try and remove the uncertainty from what we're doing when we're innovating, we're guessing. We're making a leap from this deep insight I've had to how this behavior, what effect it will have on the people I'm trying to serve. So we're still going to be wrong a lot of the time. And I think that experimental mindset uh, is really critical. And it's also critical as a change method. Right? We, when I found that you know, you'll, you'll try and get people to change something and they kind of dig in. But if you say to them, how about a small experiment? Let's just not change forever. You don't have to make a decision. How about if we just try this? And if it doesn't work, we're no worse off. We'll go back to doing it the way we the way we've done it in the past. I find people are much more open and willing to try something new if you frame it as that experiment. I don't know if you've had that experience working with your instructors. That that was how we framed it uh, in the one class. It was an experiment, and for as many maybe mistakes, if you want to call them, I don't know that I call them mistakes, but kind of trial and error. For as many times as maybe the classroom got set behind, then all of a sudden there'd just be a burst of forward movement. So it, it worked. <laughs> the, the problem after that is transferring that learning experience from that one classroom and that one teacher, then expanding it, scaling it to the rest of the teachers. I think people who aren't part of the discovery process it's much more challenging to bring them into the conversation. I think that's why this whole notion of collaboration and design go hand in hand the way they do, because um, we can go off and have all these wonderful discoveries and create great design criteria and bring these ideas to people. But if they haven't been part of the journey with us, you know, it's very difficult to motivate them and engage them. And so I, I think part of the power of design is really in 
these tools not only help us come up with better answers, they help us figure out how to work together and bring more people into the conversation in the process. Um, and in the end, I think that may well be in the business world, one of the most significant contributions of these approaches is the way they improve teamwork mm -hmm. and the ability of teams to work together. Yeah, it seemed to me that you know, from that from that side of it, uh, I'm trying to see, my, my purpose in coming is to understand this, the whole process a little bit more and how it, uh, it may have affected, I mean, we do the things that, you know, the voice of the customer and all these other types of things that you go through, but uh, this sounds like it's, you know, something uh, that maybe is a little bit Beyond that, and I think to your point, as far as having the right people on those teams, um, you can only go, you know, as far as working with a customer and taking a concept and doing a prototype and wanting to do a trial. Uh, I understand what you're saying about, you know, running running a few things, but you can only go to that well so often too. So you you need you need to have some things that are hitting. And I guess that for me, the piece that's in the middle, it sounds like it's in the middle from thinking about the ideas, getting the right people uh, together, and then what what you are going to present as the concept of the prototype, that you need to have it, uh, um, I want to say really well defined, but I mean, you know, you just can't have, you want it, you don't want to impede the creativity, but at the same time, you can't just throw a lot of things out there because you're going to lose uh, the energy, I think, by, by having a lot of uh, prototyping out there and not having the successes. So it has to be a, a good value uh, to the customer and uh, to have it to be successful. I think in some ways that's why we added the what wows stage right. that we talked right, about this right. week. I mean, because again, and this is, people have talked a lot about this in the forums, you know, the core elements of design thinking, no matter who you ask, are essentially the same. I mean, whether you go to IDEO or whether you go to any of the other design consulting firms um, or whether you look at this four questions model we've used, essentially, for the most part, there's a period of exploration that's followed by a period of ideation that's followed by a period of prototyping. I think what we've added in our model and the, and the thing that is somewhat different is that what wow stage. Yep. In some ways, that allows us to do some pre-screening as business people, right? I mean, it's expensive to take experiments to the marketplace. It's expensive in terms of customers. As you said, you can't, how many times can you go to the well, right? So we want to do some kind of pre-screening, but at the same time, we don't want to drive all the creativity out of the process too soon. And so to me, what wows creates this ability in some ways for the first time in the process to bring the business case into the customer case. <coughs> and then begin to think about how do we have just some, create these napkin pitches in which we take all of these ideas come out, coming out of brainstorming. We may narrow those down from 100 to 10, but then in what wows, we narrow those 10 napkin pitches down to maybe three that we carry into the market. Yeah, for me, I think that's, that seemed from, again, this is my first session and uh, I've only scratched the surface. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, reading through the whole process. So at least my first impression is that's the most critical phase um, in that whole process is, is making sure that you've got that wow factor. And again, the buy-in, because we, everyone has to participate in it. So it's... There's an is issue that if you get that wow and you didn't start well, then it's, you, know, you, you might not get too many wow. So it's, it's, I think it's very hard in the beginning to start the uh, what is, and then, then, uh, and then move from that exploration process forward, because it depends on how do you explore the question or the problem or the customer needs, you might get less uh, opportunities later, and then you don't get a good wow wow. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, it's for me. I mean, I think it's you know, it's, it's still the fundamentals. I mean, you're listening from a customer, looking vendor to business to business listening to what, listening first, that first step, what, what does that customer need? You know, what are their needs? What are the unmet needs? How do you create value for that customer? So you do all those basic things. And then again, having the right people, which I think is the other key is having the right people in that group that, uh, 
to identify what that one or two or three wow factors are. Um, but but I, I think it's important that also we, we use different styles and different people in the process. Sure. So, yeah. it, you know, maybe, maybe there's not like a kind of expert that will get that, but the combination of different perspectives and mindsets, each one will bring something to the table and then even um, anybody can come up with a great idea because it will combine all different um, approaches into one wow or to, into one idea. And, and that happens every time. So we were working in teams that people you know, have no ideas and then they stay in the back of the room, the whole process. And it's like, I mean, you want to do, I, I, and he says, oh, it's silly, I don't want to participate. And then when he sees uh, we're doing the uh, mind mapping or like any, anything combining everyone's ideas, they come to the front and say, oh, why don't we do this, this, and this, and combine all those ideas? So, so it's, it's um, I think it's a personality also will, will, will help out. And, and the diversity is the most important, to have that. And then, you know, people will, will match up different ideas into a good wall. Yeah, I, I agree. I think diversity, I think you hit on diversity is, is, is critical in terms of generating those ideas. Yep. I mean, you're, there are often times when you're in a business-to-business -business environment, you're working with uh, uh, someone like myself or, you know, somebody that has a given market that's been in a particular segment for so long that, you know, you, you begin, you start to just see things in, in one way. Uh, and same thing on the customer end. They're, they're on the receiving end. They've been in a particular position or the people you're working with for so long, they see only from, from their product or from their perspective. So you do need to have the other people absolutely come in because it, it makes you, uh, you know, the creativity fosters that creativity to think of things in a different way from a different segment, different market, different business, um, just to uh, provide some input that throws some new ideas out there. So yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Well, Sorry. It empowers people when you're bringing them into a discussion that they haven't previously been a part of. It empowers them and, and it sort of unlocks that creativity and gives them a venue to be able to do something with it rather than sitting around in the back of the yeah, department so just, somewhere. I'm just saying that there are different profiles. So like you said, like, okay, we get some expert to find things. And then um, because you use a different process than, you know, a regular um, secondary research and use a lot of different tools. Some people are not used to that, and then they might not be comfortable with the whole design thinking group process. And and oftentimes they come up when they see the pieces getting together in the phases in the middle of the, the, uh, the wall zone, or when, after reaching all the exploration, they see what, why, why it makes sense and then starts with the ideas. Because they, they feel uncomfortable exploring, but then they, they see ideas and they come up. It's, it's, it happens. I, I've seen a couple times. Just it, I think it is uh, interesting to have the diversity and, and you know people will participate or not as depends on the team. So but. I have a I have a question about where you might draw those people for the what wow session. In one of your videos, your guest lecture talked about borrowing intuition of your friends, would it be like Gene's friends or like people that Gene knows that wants, that want to help, that have always said, let me know if you need any help with your design thing, sounds cool. Yeah. Or are they going to be stakeholders from the company? Well, well, I mean, and we're still at idea generation here, right? Because yeah. I mean, one thing that design thinking is really clear on is, when we get into testing, there's only really one person whose mm -hmm. input we want on the test, and that's the customer, right? We're not shopping all those people we know for their opinions on the value we're creating for customers. We're actually asking the people who we're trying to create value for, what's the value <laughs> they see, right? Now, I think where Tim's talking about a real opportunity for collaboration is a lot of that is an idea generation where the diversity of perspectives. So especially we've created a set of design criteria coming out of our research. And oftentimes in design thinking, you know, there's, as we said, there's the whole converging and diverging going on. There's also, I think, movement between the small team who's actually 
doing a lot of the work and a larger group of people that can be invited in, right? So oftentimes the ethnography piece is something that the small team's doing. But when we go into mind mapping and we're looking for insights and themes, if we've created a good gallery, we can invite anybody in to be part of that. And they'll often see things that, that we haven't. Right? Same way with brainstorming. Right? If we've got good design criteria and good trigger questions, we can invite lots of other people in. And then during concept development, you would tend to go back to the smaller team, right? I invite people to input, and then during the development stage, I decide what I'm going to take and what I'm not and build into the concept, right? And then I show it to the customer and see what they say. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I think depending upon where we are in the process, there's different opportunities to invite people in and different kinds of people that we want to invite in. Well, it's also an opportunity not only to get content feedback, but as I think of some of those people as potential stakeholders yes. of getting their continued buy-in as you're mm -hmm. moving forward. Yes. One of the things, as we've learned more in teaching this process to managers, um, you know, we, we had to go back and add a set of steps before what is. Because we realized, you know, we had always just started with the design brief and said, oh, you know, you write a design brief which lays out the project and then you move into what is. But what we realized is in the planning process, if you think about not just customers, but whose support you're going to need in the end to give this idea traction, those people should be invited into the process when you can. Right. And, and, and sometimes you have to think carefully about how to orchestrate inviting them into the process in a way that it could be a positive experience and nothing that derails the conversation, right? But the sooner you can get people into the conversation who support you're eventually going to need to move forward, the, the better, I think. We did bring back to the, the school situation. We brought the teachers into the conversation, I think, too soon because we just kept getting repetition in the what is phase of what is wrong, and we couldn't get them off of what is wrong to move them to the what if phase to start to think about. And I think it might have might have been that we brought them in too early before we really had any idea where we were going. And maybe didn't have enough new information to give them. I think this is one of the things we see in strategic planning processes. I mean, we're all, I mean, a lot of us love collaboration, we love the idea of collaboration, but the reality of it is when you yeah. put the same old group of people in a room, they're going to repeat the same old things they've been saying to each other over and over again. Why do we think anyone's ever going to have a new idea unless we inspire them with something that jogs them out of the way they've always looked at the world, right? So for me, one of the real benefits of a rich conversation around what is, and creating mind maps with galleries on the wall and all is that you can give people new information and that new information can help them to think in new ways, right? Otherwise, we really kind of just waste our time because we already, it, it, most of us in organizations have been talking to the same people for a long time. When we have a meeting, we know exactly what someone's going to say before they even say it, right? That's the dilemma. That's why real progress is often so hard to get because we're all entrenched in our own beliefs because the data we've taken in tells us that our beliefs make sense. Right? Until we shake that up, really hard to get new thinking into the picture. I guess that's where that team diversity is, right? So it's the diversity of the team to create some new thoughts, new ideas, because it will just perpetuate the old ideas just Put a new word on it, but it's the same idea. So, I think from that perspective, is the uh, the diversity aspect, and especially in your initial teams, in terms of the creativity session, like you say, maybe expanding. So you have the larger team, and then then when it gets to the point of presenting to the customer uh, those concepts that are the wows and the value, is a much narrower narrower focus. And I think the other opportunity, especially in large business organizations, is crossing functions. I, I think as I think back to our original research on organic growth, I can't think of a single successful growth initiative that didn't have at its core a cross-functional team working on it. Because again, if we're in marketing, 
we're raised and trained to think like a marketer. If we're in manufacturing, we're raised and trained. If, we, if you want a good hypothesis about a workable solution, you're probably not going to get it from talking only through the perspective of, of, uh, of where we were trained, right? We need the other person in the conversation. Um, we get one of the, sorry. Just, I, um, you have a question, I'm sorry, what's your name? I, Paula. Paula, um, I, when you mentioned that you're already using, um, you have used design thinking methodology to help kind of you know, reshape the offering of a technical school, I was so impressed because I think of, you know, some of the stuff that's going on here is just kind of really being um, new. I mean, new to new to high tech startups, new to large companies, new to small companies. So I'm just wondering what was the inspiration for you to go that path? And, um, uh, and I don't know, how did you start at zero, I guess? Um, by accident. <laughs> uh, we started, uh, I started with a director just having conversations between the two of us and um, I'd been with the school five years and it was his second year and uh, he had the first year to observe and the second year to decide that something needed to take place and I was already itching to make some changes and we just started to talk about we, we have to start somewhere and it seemed logical to start with the instructors. And, um, you know, after reading our materials for this course, uh, I realized we went through the, the what is and the what if and the what wow face <laughs> just because it seemed logical to do. Did you know that's what you were doing, that it was a design? Oh, no, I just read about it. <laughs> I think it is amazing. It is so often when you pursue people who uh, have had success in the innovation sphere, they're, they'll just say, well, that's the way I've always approached things. I didn't realize I was supposed to call it design thinking. That was just the way that made sense to me. Right? So, so I think the opportunity is for the rest of us, right? for whom it isn't just intuitive to behave in these ways. Right. We started to go through the process, and then we started to research to see if there was some structure, because we did keep getting stuck at the, the what is and getting, uh, no matter what we did, it, it circled right back around and we got what is wrong instead. <laughs> so I think it took us three sessions before we figured out how to get out of that um, or how to not, how to set the boundaries to not let it get started and move to the what if uh, type phase. But we started ex actually research it and came upon the, the Darden work with Jean. I, I heard an interesting concept earlier today called appreciative inquiry. Yep. And the way it was in, described to me was that you are drawing out people's feedback of the what is under the premise that they should be thinking constructively instead of what is wrong. More like, how can we, I guess it comes from like appreciating what is good and what can be possible. But also it made me think about like a stock appreciating. <laughs> that was interesting. Increasing in value. I think part of the problem, too, was the lack of diversity because we kept bringing the same teachers together and, you know, the definition of insanity, we look for a different outcome in the same. Surely if we have one more meeting, we'll get, we'll, we'll have a brilliant creative idea. <laughs> Set the stage and get a different response. Paula, in addition to your teachers, are there other stakeholders that are important to your undertaking? Oh, yes. I mean, it's expanded well beyond that. That was our, our starting, of course, the boards of education that are involved, students, the parents, uh, the, the trade industry itself. So now when we have a meeting, we bring them all in. And it works much better. <laughs> Should we maybe take a couple of the questions? I yeah. noticed, Louise, you've been uh, busy uh, dutifully noting questions that we're getting. So there's a, there's, there's a question that Sarah sent, that, but I think uh, I don't know if you want to jump into that one because I see that we have uh, three people with the same um, difficulties. So, how to get support to design thinking from a traditional business? Um, how to show the business value? Should we use a, a small project? What, what ideas do you have to bring this into a, a large organization? And there is also people asking here about entrepreneurship or startups. How can you? Show, show to people the value of design thinking and 
and again, another person here uh, further up, how can you involve stakeholders that doesn't show interest to solve the problem? So many political interests, how do you convince people and how you show your value? I mean, and this is something that we're going to talk some about in week five because it is such an important issue, I think. Um, uh, and at some level, when I think about it, I think it, in, in some ways it's a really straightforward answer, right? Find somebody with a problem that design thinking is a good opportunity to solve. Or they, they probably design thinking brings something that they don't already have to a problem they really care about. I, I think too often when we fall in love with something like design thinking or whatever it is, we run around trying to use it for everything and getting frustrated if other people don't immediately see what we see in it and see the value of the process. Right? But, but I always think back to some of the great conversations, for instance, with the folks at Intuit, who are, I think are doing such great work in this area. And, um, and their argument is, you know, we don't go off and talk about design thinking as an initiative. We go look for some other problem somebody's trying to solve, and then we demonstrate how we could maybe use design thinking to solve their problem. But, but it's a means to an end and not an end in and of itself. And I think for many of us who are drawn to the method, we're kind of like missionaries, right? And it can be very frustrating when you put it out there and people come back at you with all the traditional business arguments. You know, your, your sample size is too small and blah, 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 blah. We're in B2B, none of this matters. And it can get very frustrating, um, which is why I think, if, if, you, if someone doesn't have a problem that they've been unable to solve to their satisfaction using what they already know how to do, chances are they're not going to embrace something new that sounds weird that they don't know how to do. <clears throat> so I think that's, that's one way to think about where to, where to start when we, when we pull this process up. Right? With, with, where to start with unsympathetic people. Now, with sympathetic people, you have a lot more leeway in terms of where you can start and the kind of issues you can tackle. I don't know what you're experiencing, Jen, in your organization as um, you try and do this. Matter of fact, my first manager said, start with your friends. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, they, they'll be open to at least going the first round with you. Mm -hmm. um, I find that I'm taking the tools and I'm then translating them into my company's lingo. Mm -hmm. And they don't know it's design thinking that they're doing. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you go back, like a, a, a Claudia Kotchke at P&G would say, we never called it design thinking early on. Because, it, I mean, it isn't a great term. Let's face it, we all wish they'd come up, but we, somebody would come up with a better one because it, it kind of sounds mysterious and weird to managers. Um, what it was was a problem-solving approach. Right? And then after a while, it became okay to talk about it as design thinking. And then, you know, when it's really working, we won't have to call it anything special at all, right? It'll be like quality. It'll just be the way people do things. And then it won't need to be called out as anything special. Oh, interesting. The cultural shift. Mm -hmm. the cultural shift. Well, speaking on that, one of the speakers uh, that we had uh, – come recently who was a very successful um, in growing a company and it sort of touches on a couple of things that uh, you said. He, he never called it design thinking. Like I asked him, is that what you're doing? And he said no. Uh, and as he was going through his talk, um, you know, he clearly was uh, doing a lot of these processes and somebody asked, and he talked a lot about culture. That's what made me think of it, how uh, he developed a culture within the company and how important that was uh, to the overall growth and the success of the company. Um, but uh, he said, um, and this goes to diversity too, if he'd known what he was, somebody asked him, did you know that you were going to develop that culture when you went into this com company? It was kind of an old, basic, very basic product. Um, and he said, no, no. He goes, but I didn't know anything about the industry. And if I did, I would have just come in. I don't think I ever would have achieved this because I would have just come in and told everybody what to do because I would have known. But because I didn't know, I had to do, I use these processes, which she doesn't call design thinking, and really, really brought everybody in the company into the process. And it had incredible diversity. So, you know, get everybody from the customer support person to the main 
manufacturing to the product marketing, all you know, sitting in and doing these sessions. And uh, he developed a really, really powerful culture, which just you know brought success way beyond anything you could have imagined in terms of organic growth. And you have to meet him someday. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and I do think you know there are some things that design thinking really requires, like a tolerance for failure, that are not really part of most organizational cultures, no matter what we say, right? So, right, it, 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 you know, the other thing is, I think design thinking requires a tolerance for inefficiency. And, you know, even more than failure, we hate inefficiency. Most of us are trained that inefficiency is that's the worst thing in the world, right? And that's, we should all be lean and we should drive all variants out of the system, right? So there's a lot about design thinking that bumps up against what we've been taught in organizations is good management. Right? And so I, I think that, you know, that that makes talking about it uh, and selling it a challenge. You, you really do have to, I think, find these opportunities like you're talking about, Jen, with the, the kind of small wins and, and, build on it. and build on that. It takes a little giving up control, too. Oh, yes. I, you know, when I was working with the director, he was he knew where he wanted to go. He knew where he wanted to the other stakeholders to, to get to and trying, I had to ask him to leave the room after a while because he'd telegraph and then everyone in the room would start anticipating and trying to guess what he was, guess the right answer, guess what he wanted. And we, we had to get him out of the room. <laughs> he recognized it though. And you know, the whole process changed him too. It is true. So a few of the threads have talked about the role of hierarchy in brainstorming in particular, but in general, it is very difficult to have an honest, open conversation with the presence of serious hierarchy in the room, right? And how you, and in and it business organizations, hey, we're all about hierarchy, right? There's very few organizations that aren't, and so how you kind of get to the authentic conversations in light of, of that kind of attention to hierarchy, I think is, you know, one of the big challenges. I think because design is so specific in its tools, you really structure really helps in situations like that. I think it, and I think it's the contribution somewhat of of structure that has really helped there. But it's not it's not easy. It's a challenge. Frank, you wanted to say something. It seems like one of the greatest challenges for a successful design thinking process is the very first conversation that you have when you're setting up the. 10 week period or whatever, managing the expectations of the business owner or the, the key stakeholders. Like you said, yes, it's going to be inefficient, but you need to make sure that person knows that it's going to be inefficient so they're not surprised and try to shut it down when it doesn't match what they thought it would look like. Yeah, and this whole question of expectation setting, I think, is really important. There's interesting research on change that says in organizations, a lot of times, the reason why change efforts fail, it's not because the effort has really failed, but because the leader had unrealistic expectations about how long it would take and declared it a failure. <clears throat> right? And think how often we do that, especially as leaders. We think everyone else sees the world the way we do. So we lay out, well, this is what, and it should take us three months to get there, right? But it's obvious to us where the there is, and the people we're talking with haven't even figured out the there yet, right? And so it doesn't take three months, it takes six months, and in month, it would take six months, except that in month five, we declare it a, a failure and pull the plug because it isn't where we thought it should be, right? And I think that's, you know, that's part of the, that's part of the challenge here. How do we hold our own expectations in check enough? to give other people the time to get ideas. The trouble is sometimes it's not obvious that they're actually getting them. Right. I have uh, some of my ideas also that I had see three problems. One, one was uh, people that don't understand what design thinking is, people that don't believe, and people that um, don't, know, don't know or don't want to um, feel fear of participation due to hierarchy. So, for the first thing in the people that were not knowledgeable because I think they had no clue, um, we, we try to split the work in a way that um, people would just, you know, make it small things. So let's say you do interview and then 
you go and um, come back when you do brainstorming. So try to do it in a way that people who didn't feel uh, feel more comfortable because they knew what's going on, and also um, get them to participate in the steps that you know you think they they will contribute more. And the second thing was using um, anonymous brainstorming. So it, you know you know you need to tell something about the customer or some things you you know, sometimes don't want to say because your boss is there or because it's you feel ridiculous. So you know we had notes or we had digital ways that we did anonymously, and then when we would collect, we will get together and use a wall and sometimes said. Oh, who the hell posted this? But you know, it, it was it was already there, so it's it's another way. One of the things that I think is most fun to do in brainstorming is to get people to brainstorm bad ideas. <laughs> Where we do a round, which is just okay. Now this round of brainstorming, we're going to come up with the worst ideas we could possibly come. What would we never do under any set of circumstances? And it's amazing how liberating that can be to people, right? And oftentimes, out of those bad ideas, there's actually it sparks an inspiration or some something new. Not that idea per se, but you know something a, a different path when we go down it. So. Maybe that helps some people who think their good idea is bad, gives them a place to say it out loud. Yeah. 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 And, and diminish the good idea that is bad, it gets less, yeah. uh, uh, um, people notice less as well. So you, you minimize that the people that talk more and also make it more inefficient to listen to, to the others. So everybody have equal voice in that. Process as as a challenging thing to do and very important. Um, you want more questions uh, from the sure? We can take one more. I think I was going to suggest that we at six fifteen begin eating uh, eating uh, cheese and, and and crackers again. <laughs> yeah. So. So maybe take one more. Yeah. The, um, this question from Sarah is about interviews, how to scale it. Yeah, we talked about that one a little bit. Um, and then you had also during that surge and. Oh, that's an interesting. This question of um, have you used design thinking for brand making? And I think his name is Rustam Borovic because it's written in Russian characters. So mm -hmm. Rustam Borovic. So um, you know about brand making? People had used uh, design thinking process, or or were more for like product creation and when they already have a certain kind of organization. Because I know some startups um, are built on design thinking. But when you want to already have a brand and you want to enforce it, how, how do you? Well, you know, the brand people have always recognized emotion. Really, if you go back into marketing, emotion's been recognized as an important part of brand, so the brand message forever and ever. And so in, in, in some ways, in some organizations, when you find people who are doing design thinking, they call it brand. I mean, we find with uh, with clients when we're taking in projects for the MBAs to work on, oftentimes they will be calling branding what we're calling design thinking, and I think that's 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 intriguing to me. But um, but again, I think it's because of that recognition that a lot of this is an emotional journey, not just a functional journey, and we need to kind of reach something deeper in terms of insights about people. Now, sometimes in marketing, I worry that's just convincing people to buy things that they don't necessarily want to make. <laughs> right? Right? And we like to think in design thinking, the difference is we're really trying to create value. We're trying to go deep to understand what would create value for someone, not try and convince someone that what we've already got is going to create value for them, really regardless of whether you know whether it does or not. So that's, that's kind of what I cling to as the difference, that ultimately design thinking is not about making a brand. It's about really figuring out how to create value for human beings. Um, and some brands do that and some brands don't. <clears throat> well, good to see this. It's another one. Uh, any suggestions about journey mapping? Um, so I have a couple questions here. People are more a bit uh, difficulties. If we could give any examples of journey mapping because uh, they're not used to the tool. 
Well, maybe Jen, when you did your journey mapping, did you start by laying out all of the steps in the performance? That's usually step one, is yes. lay out every single individual step beginning to end, right, in the process. Yeah, we, we actually worked at a whiteboard and we laid out the steps. Um, now, interesting enough is when you had different groups look at it, they said, now wait a minute, how about this step? Or that's not important in my world. Mm -hmm. So it, it was different. So having it on a whiteboard was great because you could erase and you could add. And then we had, just using Post-its just in terms of people identifying the experience. And and it was interesting to me to see how different groups highlighted different steps along the initial process map. But it was also helpful because if we think of going to the next step, um, it gives us a sense of what are some of the um, – you know, pain points that we've got to work through. Yeah. And especially where you get shared pain points. Yes. In some ways, that's your most valuable spot to start any innovation at because you can create wins for people, at, at, you know, from multiple perspectives in a, value, in a chain. We find even the map itself is a hypothesis, right? So normally when we do journey mapping, we would try and lay out a path Right, beginning to end, oftentimes just laying out a path that goes beyond the part of it that you control. I mean, everyone wants to journey map the part that they control, right? But a lot of the innovation opportunities are usually upstream and downstream. So as soon as you make someone map the whole journey from the very beginning when a customer decides to do something, right through the end when there's some job created, creating the map itself can often add value. Um, and then when you actually take the map out to a customer and you begin to see, to your point, Jen, where the steps in the journey, there, there are steps in the journey you haven't even seen often or have completely underestimated the significance of, mm -hmm. uh, there's learning in almost every step of the way, I think, in the process. Well, the other, it was, it was an important step just to creating a, a common language. Yeah. yeah, because before that, every, everybody was solving it. It was sort of five blind men in the elephant. Different people were solving the problem from where they viewed it. And just getting even the, a process map was common language. We, we don't talk a lot about system thinking necessarily as part of design thinking, but, but clearly one of the things that we're trying to do is lay out the whole system. And we're trying to understand the context that things are operating in, right, and what the perspective is from the different parts. And, I, I, yeah, I think that whole idea of laying out the system and understanding, you know, so often when we try and optimize a system, and, of course, all organizations are systems, we optimize our little piece of it. And by definition, we sub-optimize other people when we optimize one piece without a view of the larger system. So I think in that way, yeah, we can go back to, to re-engineering, which essentially is about how do we understand the whole system and, so that we start from that perspective of the whole rather than our own individual narrow kind of blind man and the elephant view of something. Well, shall we go get some cheese and crackers and turn off the video and say goodbye to everyone for... Yeah. Some future people who will actually look at this <laughs> or not, right? Yeah, please. Thank you, uh, so thank you for your questions and um, send them to the forum and also to Twitter, hashtag design this, or to my uh, Twitter at Luis Veloso. I'll bring them to the QA next week as well. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. And then this is the awesome. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know.